The voice of Americanism in 1919 was that of Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts. Look at the United States today. Is there any country today on the face of the earth which can compare with this in ordered liberty? Some people thought that the League of Nations was going to save the human race. Other people thought just the opposite, that it was going to be the end of America. My grandfather got caught in this exchange of uh, extremist opinions. I will go as far as anyone in world service, but the first step to world service is the maintenance of the United States. This is the story of the tragic and futile fight over the League of Nations, but it is more than the bitter struggle between Senator Henry Cabot Lodge and President Woodrow Wilson. It is also the story of a nation turned upside down by World War I, in a state of disillusionment that defied grand rhetoric and lofty ideals. The pressures on 1919 America were devastating, inflation, strikes, race riots, hysteria over Bolshevism. Americans were suffering from self-interest, ignorance, apathy, inertia, and had very little concern for the rest of the world. Post-war America was, in the words of one senator, in a state of shell shock. The focal point of agitation was an uneasy American labor movement. In 1919, four million workers walked off the job in 3,600 different strikes. The most violent disorders were the race riots that summer. The great general issue was not Wilson's League of Nations, but the high cost of living. Woodrow Wilson had spent a heady two months at the Paris Peace Conference in Europe. Returning through the port of Boston, he considered himself the victor in all the battles waged at Versailles. At home, he expected to secure the congressional stamp of approval for the League of Nations without a problem. The heartening sound of welcome drew the president into a serious blunder. He chose to announce his peace program to a gathering in Boston. But Boston was the home city of Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, dedicated opponent of Wilsonian internationalism. Wilson's speech would be doubly inappropriate since he had asked the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which Lodge headed, to remain silent on the League until he met with them. Wilson violated his own request by speaking in Boston. He did not mention Lodge's name, but declared that any man who resists the League will find himself cast away by humanity. I have fighting blood in me, Wilson said, and it is sometimes a delight to let it have scope. The Foreign Relations Committee was delighted to accept the challenge. It was dominated by a group of senators opposed to the League of Nations in any form. Lodge headed the committee, but he was ably supported by master obstructionists known as the Irreconcilables. Senator Frank Brandegee of Connecticut, cynical, morose, and bitter, planned much of the strategy. Philander Knox of Pennsylvania was the legal brains of the bitter enders. Joseph Medill McCormick of Illinois, the conservative publisher, was a chief fundraiser. Albert Fall of New Mexico, later a key figure in President Harding's Teapot Dome scandal. James Reed of Missouri, an iconoclast and maverick, a Wilson hater and an isolationist. Hiram Johnson of California was the rabble rouser of the group, one of the great stump speakers of his time. Senator William Bora, the eloquent, passionate isolationist from Idaho, was a spiritual leader of the group. American presidents have often invited Senate leaders to the White House for dinner to discuss differences in a friendly social atmosphere. 
Most of those dinners go unrecorded, and that's a pity because they're usually more revealing than the headlines. So after he returned to Washington, President Wilson invited the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for dinner. At the dinner that evening, Lodge sat next to Mrs. Wilson, the only woman present. Mrs. Wilson was hardly tactful when she remarked with enthusiasm about the magnificent reception the Senators Boston had given them. Senator Lodge, a somewhat stiff man anyway, sat in cold politeness. The give and take concerned the Monroe Doctrine, how to withdraw from the League of Nations if necessary, and protecting the right of Congress to declare war and send troops into combat. The importance of that tense evening at the White House lay in the fact that it only strengthened hostilities and misunderstandings. Afterwards, Senator Lodge said the president's performance was anything but good. He told us nothing. Wilson later called his antagonists blind and little provincial people who were going to have the most conspicuously contemptible names in history. But the most cutting remark came from Senator Brandegee of Connecticut, who said, I feel as if I had been wandering with Alice in Wonderland and had tea with the Mad Hatter. The Irreconcilables devised a shrewd tactic to undermine the president. It was called the Round Robin. Senator Lodge presented the resolution to the Senate, which declared that the League of Nations in its present form is unacceptable. 37 senators had signed it, which meant that Wilson could not get a two-thirds majority. A few days later, Lodge gave his most eloquent speech against the League, fittingly in Boston. You may call me selfish, if you will, conservative or reactionary, or use any other harsh adjective you see fit to apply. But an American I was born, an American I have remained all my life. I can never be anything else but an American, and I must think of the United States first. Lodge was an extreme nationalist, wanted a punitive peace. Now, he was not an isolationist. He would have favored a treaty of alliance with France and England. He believed in force, and he had utter contempt for Wilson's uh, own objectives and ideals. And the, well, the notion of the two men working together is, 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 is just absurd. I have loved but one flag, and I cannot share that devotion and give affection to the mongrel banner invented for a league. Well, people thought that he was negative and was against any kind of peace organization. Well, that really is not true. His, uh, his position was that he favored uh, uh, ratifying the League of Nations Covenant with reservations. And uh, the principle of one of those uh, reservations was the one that said that U.S. troops would only be used subject to a resolution of Congress. In other words, denying the League of Nations the power to order out uh, U.S. troops. Well, today, nobody would think of uh, saying that the United Nations ought to have the right to order out U.S. troops. There's a good deal of feeling that uh, the U.S. government shouldn't have the right to order out U.S. troops. Lodge, the patrician from Boston, found a natural ally in the populace from Idaho, William Bora. It was the conviction of two of the greatest statesmen the world has ever known, Washington and Jefferson, that to involve this nation in European political problems was to undermine and ultimately destroy the whole scheme of our free institutions. Give us an American policy, a policy suitable to American institutions, and conforming at all times to American ideas. Idaho, Bora country, was a land that shaped the thoughts of its sons and daughters. Her people held self-reliance as the most enduring value. This is Bora country, unmovable in its attachment to isolation. Bora's hometown, Boise, was like most small towns in rural America, captured in Sinclair Lewis's 1919 novel, Main Street. This is America, he wrote, a town of a few thousand in a region of wheat and corn and dairies and little groves. Its Main Street is a continuation of Main Streets everywhere. The only ardent new topics were prohibition, the place where you could get whiskey at $13 a quart, 
recipes for homemade beer, the high cost of living, the presidential election, Clark's new car. Their problems were exactly what they had been two years ago, what they had been 20 years ago, and what they would be for 20 years to come. July 4th, 1919. It was the first peaceful, settled summer since the war began. It was quite a day. In Chicago, nearly 20,000 fans saw young Jack Dempsey become the new heavyweight champion of the world. The Chicago White Sox would be accused of throwing the World Series that year. And for the sum of $125,000, the New York Yankees would buy a promising young outfielder named Babe Ruth. On July 4, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson was at sea on his way back from the Paris Peace Conference. The president was tired of compromise. He was in a fighting mood. When he left Paris, he told Colonel House, I have found one can never get anything in this life that is worthwhile without fighting for it. On July 10th, the president formally presented the peace treaty to the Senate. Dare we reject it and break the heart of the world, he asked. As he spoke, Republican senators sat in stern silence. His words rang out. The stage is set, the destiny disclosed, we cannot turn back. The president did not realize it yet, but forces other than the irreconcilables had lined up against him. A new coalition was gaining strength. Professor Robin Winks of Yale. But it was not only the isolationists or the so-called irreconcilables in the Senate, because there were many who saw themselves as international-minded, who feared that the League of Nations would be used as an instrument for British and other European imperialisms and didn't want to see the United States become a party to imperialism. So you had a fascinating union between reactionary, right-leaning groups and internationalist, liberal, left-leaning groups that joined together to defeat our entry into uh, the League of Nations and specifically to defeat the original conception of the Peace of Versailles. Opposition to Wilson came from still another unexpected source, the militant wing of the women's suffrage movement. Suffragette Alice Paul accused the president of neglecting the issue. Wilson remained neutral while most of the nation agreed with Al Jolson's view. When the growing up ladies act like babies, I've got to love them, that's all. I can't realize the grown-up ladies keep us up a lava. I want to be the papa when they walk like babies, talk like babies, but at the time I fall. And so say baby, 43. I gotta bounce them up and down, that is me. When the growing up ladies act like babies, I gotta love them, that's all. Women's suffrage would soon be left behind. The immediate issue was the League of Nations. Wilson went to the people for support. As the president left, the irreconcilable sent their own speakers, known as the Battalion of Death, to hound him at every turn. You may call me selfish, if you will, conservative or reactionary. I have loved but one flag, and I cannot share that devotion and give affection to the mongrel banner invented for a league. The grueling train trip covered 8,000 miles. The president wrote and delivered 40 speeches. There was the heat, the smoke, the cinders, the dust, the endless handshaking, the receptions, the motorcades. Senators Johnson and Bora followed him. We are plunging into the very heart of Europe and seizing hold of their problems. Leave her to march freely through the centuries to come, as in the years that have gone. Give us a policy suitable to American institutions and conforming at all times to American ideas. In San Diego, a delirious crowd of 50,000 filled Balboa Stadium to hear the president. He was exhausted, suffering severe headaches. A newfangled contraption called a public address system was used for the first time. It made speaking much easier, but the voices of Lodge and Bora haunted him. We are dealing with nations, every one of which has a direct individual interest to serve. It was the conviction of Washington and Jefferson 
that to involve this nation in European political problems. There is grave danger in an unshared idealism. And ultimately destroyed. In Pueblo, Colorado, Woodrow Wilson gave the last speech of his public career. At the Pueblo Railroad Station, the nightmare journey reached its climax. You may call me selfish, 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 selfish. Plunging, we are plunging, plunging into the very heart of Europe. I must think of the United States first, 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 first. Give us an American policy. An American policy. Allegiance, allegiance. Washington and Jefferson. Flag, I have loved but one flag. Those ancient quarrels and controversies. Banner, 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 intent, intent. The president's fragile health gave way. His head throbbed in pain. He had trouble focusing. Dr. Grayson canceled the rest of the trip and rushed him home. Five days later, Wilson suffered a severe stroke. Dr. Edwin Weinstein. He was paralyzed on the left side of his body, and he was practically blind. Wilson also had a condition that is common after damage to the right hemisphere called anosognosia, which means lack of awareness and knowledge of disease. And for many months, uh, Wilson seemed not to appreciate uh, the seriousness uh, of his condition and not to realize that it made him incapable of carrying on the duties of president. And a remarkable thing that Wilson actually sought a nomination uh, for uh, a third term. Wilson was desperately ill, but neither the cabinet nor the public was aware of his critical condition. The president's mind was clear, but he was physically enfeebled and emotionally upset. Mrs. Wilson shielded her husband from anything that might alarm him. She isolated him from the outside world. Just two days before the crucial vote on the treaty, this is how Woodrow Wilson looked. Professor Arthur Link of Princeton. It has often been said that Mrs. Wilson was the first woman president of the United States. I once asked Mrs. Wilson that question. She said over and over, I am first of all the wife of Woodrow Wilson and secondly the wife of the president of the United States. And uh, as wife, uh, she, I think, tended to lean over backwards in keeping uh, difficult or distressing or stressful things from him. That included his mail, which Mrs. Wilson rigidly censored. Colonel House, a tired and sick man, tried unsuccessfully to see the president. He had sent three letters to Wilson urging him to compromise. They were not answered. November 19th, 1919. It was time for the Senate to vote on the League of Nations. President Wilson remained inflexible to the end and opposed any changes. He specifically objected to the Lodge reservations, which would limit American involvement in the League. Senator Lodge and the Irreconcilables looked forward to the debate. There was no democratic strategy. Cut off from the president, the Democratic leader, Gilbert Hitchcock, did his valiant best for the League. The trouble with senators who oppose the League of Nations is that they are thinking of the days that are gone and gone forever. Beware how you trifle with your marvelous inheritance. For if we stumble and fall, freedom and civilization everywhere will go down in ruins. The confidence of men in government has been shaken. It will never be restored until government devise some way to end war. The League of Nations is that way. The Senate rejected the Versailles Peace Treaty that day because Woodrow Wilson refused to compromise. He had instructed Democrats to vote against the treaty with Lodge's reservations. I felt that um, if President Wilson had been in his usual good health, uh, a compromise could have been reached, and we and the United States uh, might well have joined the League of Nations. Um, but the president, but President Wilson was was uh, suffering from a stroke, and he insisted on all or nothing. He, he insisted that 
uh, as to use his own phrase, that should be ratified without the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. And of course, he couldn't get a two-thirds vote uh, for that proposition. On Inauguration Day 1921, a solemn Woodrow Wilson listened as President-elect Warren Harding put an end to Wilsonian internationalism. But I have a confidence in our America that requires no council of foreign powers to point the way of American duty. Call it the selfishness of nationality, if you will. I think it's an inspiration to patriotic devotion, to safeguard America first to stabilize America first, to prosper America first, to think of America first, to exalt America first, to live for and revere America first. Let the internationalist dream and the Bolshevists destroy. In the spirit of the Republic, we proclaim Americanism and acclaim America. Woodrow Wilson, the incurable idealist, lost the most important battle of his career, and it was unnecessary. Had Wilson compromised, the United States would have joined the League of Nations, and we'll never know how that might have changed history. In the words of one historian, with his own sickly hands, Wilson slew his own brainchild. He could not stand compromise, and this was his tragic flaw. He had a moral view of life that saw issues in black and white with no shades of gray. But Wilson was a sick man. And as his biographer said, perhaps he would have yielded in the end if disease had not dethroned his reason. Woodrow Wilson tried to lead us into world affairs. He believed in internationalism, but we were not ready for it. In the end, we took the advice of George Washington, who had warned against entangling foreign alliances. We reverted to our traditional isolationism. And in the course of events, the US Senate laid both hands on foreign policy Control it would not give up until December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day.